It's time for fun, learning, commentary, laughs, and more care of the most diverse group in the genealogy and family history world. Welcome to Black Pro Gen Live with your hosts, Nika and True, and the baddest panel in these pedigree streets, Angela, James, Linda, Alex, Ellen, Tony, Shelly, Teresa, Bernice, Felicia, Willie, Renata, and Tasia. It's Black Pro Gen Live, genealogy, family history research with flavor. Good evening, everyone. Hello to everyone out there and welcome to Black Pro Gen Live, where your genealogy has seasoning and we are so glad to see you all back here and we're glad to be back. Um, my name is True Lewis and I'm gonna be your co-host for, for the evening. And I'm gonna turn my hot mic over to your girl and our host, Nika Smith. Hey, y'all. What is up, True Ann? How are you, my friend? Good, baby girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. We hope you all are good. Thank you so much for joining us on this Tuesday night, this warm, summery Tuesday night here to talk genealogy with seasoning with your favorite crew, Black Pro Gen Live. Tonight's topic 135,000 people of color were sold there as enslaved people. In contrast, 20% of the population of the city were free people of color prior to the Civil War. Learn the ins and outs of researching genealogy and family history in this important location, my favorite place on planet Earth, bar none, no question, and I've been to several continents, New Orleans, Orleans Parish, Louisiana is our topic for tonight. All right, if you have a question or comment, join the conversation now, participate in the live chat on YouTube to the top right of the screen if you're watching on a computer and at the bottom of the YouTube app on your mobile device. Also, feel free to weigh in on Twitter by tweeting us at BlackProGen or use the hashtag BlackProGen. If you ever wanted to watch a show live and somehow you missed it and you were wondering how in the world could you remind yourself, well, here is your reminder to set reminders. All you need to do is head to my YouTube channel, who is Nika Smith, and click set reminder under the episodes that you're interested in, or simply subscribe to the channel and you'll get a reminder each and every time I post something or we go live. Here is your reminder. Also, we've got a bunch of BPG merch available. We've seen this all over the place at conferences and wherever else. In fact, I have worn my sweatshirt into the ground. I can't speak for anyone else in terms of their t-shirts, lunch bags, whatever, but I love my Black Pro Gen Life sweatshirt. <laughs> it is my research companion. If I'm up late and usually, I don't know if you all are cold like I am, I'm always cold. I usually have on my Black Pro Gen Life sweatshirt at the computer with my fuzzy socks on. So here is your reminder to get your BPG merch go ahead and head to the link there. We have sweatshirts, t-shirts, lunch bags, doggy out outfits, anything you could possibly think of for you to rep Black Pro Gen live. If you are just like us and you're tired of seeing Confederate flags, ships, flowers, and the wrong oil paintings as profile images for your ancestors, or maybe there's a picture for someone who wasn't even born when photography actually came out. That's my favorite one to nitpick on now. Black Pro Gen Life here is, is here to save the day. Download our new icons for online tree profiles today. These actually show up amazingly on through lines on fan, on uh, ancestry dna we're adding new ones all the time so if we miss something be sure to let us know also for those researching people of color were your ancestors enslaved or were they free do you have a story in the family of a mixed heritage with native americans could you possibly have ancestors who were in the civil war or did some become contrabands are you considering writing your family's history if any of these questions pertain to you and the genealogy work that you conduct then maggie the midwest african-american genealogy institute may unlock more doors this institute is unique as it offers six tracks over three days that's a total of 72 classes all pertaining to african 
African-American genealogy. Maggie unfolds at the world-renowned genealogy center at the Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana, July 9th through the 11th, 2019. Classes are small, intense, and focused. The tracks offer sessions in in-depth slavery era research, unique record sets, beginning and advanced DNA classes, methods of researching pre- and post-slavery era documents from military to migration and more. And for the first time, Maggie is offering an intense dive into the records of the five civilized tribes. Join us at Maggie, the teaching institute. Make the best investment in your family's future and past. Choose Maggie. And I just want to remind everybody, registration is open until June. June 30th. So be sure to get those registrations in so you can join us at Maggie 2019. All right, everyone, come off mute. It's a festive evening. We're going to have us a good time in here tonight. All right. All right. We got coming from the West Coast, we've got Alex Trap Chabala in his yes, in his so what <laughs> shirt. I see you. I see you. Oh, no, 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 no. Not so what. Not so what. So Creole, all right, yeah, all right, all yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. We're going to head over to the next coast to my soror in pink, who is also wearing our Mardi Gras triad of colors, Miss Bernice Alexander Bennett. Hello, everyone, New Orleans native. Hey, <laughs> just living in Maryland, but New Orleans is but where I'm from. Exactly. <laughs> That's in her heart. It is in her heart. It's in my heart, our, yes. Our special guest tonight who is decked out in full carnival attire, okay? <laughs> she came to the party dressed appropriately. She did not show up to the wedding in something crazy. She didn't wear, she didn't wear white like the bride. She, she came appropriate. If a second line roll by her house right now. She would be so ready to get into the line and dance her situation. She looks so festive until I just feel so delinquent. Karen Harper Royal, take yourself off mute and join us, girl, with your mask, with your purple shirt, with your backdrop, with your headdress, with your, with your, with your, with your hole, with your, with your. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Hi, everyone. I just decided I felt like being a little extra tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Look, this is the episode to be extra on. This is the extra episode. <laughs> and true, look at true. Chu Ann is, is coming. She is using her family reunion masquerade ball uh, festivity decorations. She's making sure she's getting more than one usage out of them. I am not mad at her. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I feel like I'm on Bourbon Street tonight. <laughs> that's something I would do. I'm not even from New Orleans, but being around you all all the time, I'm like, hey, I could do this. <laughs> yes, you could. Yes, you could. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah. So, I, I am still festive. I am, you know, I do have my Zulu, made my little medallion mm. into a choker. Uh, so that, that I am representing tonight. So this is, I'm so glad the entire panel is, is on this. I, it just, it just brings me just new levels of delight that the entire panel has participated in all of our, uh, extra New Orleans festivities. I mean, cause what, what else, what else do we do in Louisiana and particularly New Orleans, but be extra. That is our job is to be entirely extra. So <laughs> we can go off script every once in a while. Absolutely. Yeah. There is, there is absolutely nothing wrong wrong with that. So chat room, we love you. Thanks so much for joining us. There's people checking in from all over the place. Let's see. Gosh, it's just a flying by. First person in tonight was Diana. Oh, Lord, did the child. Hey, girl. Do, do y'all. <laughs> the extra hat. Oh, my gosh. How did I, take I can't wear it the whole episode because it's too heavy. <laughs> it's too heavy and it broke my microphone. <laughs> As you can see, but um, I just I felt a little left out for a minute. So it's okay. It, Look, I only I only have all this little blue, so don't don't feel bad. Oh my lord, y'all, this is gonna be hilarious tonight. <laughs> Diana James Wender, thanks so much for joining us from Hampton, Virginia. Trisha Blount, Casey, hey, Maggie alum is in the house. Zelda Ross, Raymond Reeves, my cousin, hey, boo, another Maggie, uh, soon to be alum, Cecilia Matoya Charles, thanks for joining us from Texas. Another. Maggie alum, soon to be alum, Denise Muhammad, Dale E. Colson. She uh, is in New Jersey. Uh, Shelly is in the house along with Linda Sims, panelists here on Black Pro Gen Live. Janice Loveless, hey, one of the instructors and faculty at Maggie is there. Oh boy, M Neff Hawthorne has picked her second quarter blackberries and she's still waiting on her tomatoes. 
I look, my tomatoes are as tall as me. I just went out to the garden and yes. And if you follow me on social media, you you saw the, the cabbage that I just I just sawed out of my uh out of my garden. It is it it is major. I love it. Love it. Thank you so much for joining us, you guys. Tom Reed from Family Search, you're there. We love you. Chat room is flying. Thank you so much, Carmen, our friend in genealogy, Angela Walter Raji, who I have to give her a hit. She conquered a fear today, and I'm so proud of her. She did amazing. So Angela, I just want to give you, I just want to give you a shout out in person. Um, we, yeah, she, she's amazing. Love her, love her, love her. All right. So topic of the evening, we are talking about New Orleans. As I mentioned, my favorite, favorite place on earth. Let's talk about the history of people of color in New Orleans. Who wants to jump in with that first? Don't all jump in all immediately. New Orleans has a long history of free people of color that takes us all the way back to colonial times. Uh, not to mention the fact that we have had stories and all kinds of information to tell us about our free people of color. They were in the War of 1812. We have the documentation to support that. We have the Civil War. Uh, so just the first group of Civil War soldiers. We have so much rich documentation of uh, people of color in New Orleans. We created New Orleans, I would love to say. <laughs> Can I jump in after her? Sure, go ahead. So, so I, I mean, it's always hard coming after Bernice, honest to God, hey y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that first, one of the, the the pieces about New Orleans that I feel is so important for Black people is that New Orleans, can, you know, we, it was the the largest slave market in in the U.S. Um, so countless of our ancestors, whether you are a native of New Orleans or not, or whether your family even um, stayed in Louisiana for a long time, so many folks came through that through that port before really being turned into African Americans, right? Um, so that piece in itself is a big deal, but then New Orleans also is a very special place because it allowed Black people to be Black, um, essentially, in a way that the rest of the country um, chose intently to erase. So that is one of the biggest things that I think that when we look at researching our ancestors in New Orleans, we have to understand how that influence comes in because you're going to see some family dynamics that you will really see mirrored in a lot of different parts of the of the country. So uh, I'll pass it on to Miss Karen. I see she has something to say. Yes, uh, one of the things I'd like to say is that I thought I was just so New Orleans. My roots were deep, deep, deep here in New Orleans. But once I started researching, I found that I have roots all along the river parishes all along the uh, Bayou parishes, and then even out in Southwest Louisiana. So, you know, it's so clear that um, throughout the ages, people migrated from the smaller towns into New Orleans, uh, whether they were free. And of course, we know they had no choice if their um, enslavers had their house out in the country, but they also had their townhouse in New Orleans. So they would bring uh, their enslaved properties back and forth. Uh, so, uh, so many of our ancestors have roots inside of New Orleans, but also in some of the uh, river parishes or bayou parishes. Absolutely, I can I can attest to that myself. Um, in fact, we're going to get to that much later. But um, there's a movie I will never forget when I saw the Feast of All Saints. It's based off of a book by Anne Rice, and it talks about that whole duality, right, of just the unique culture. I always tell people, if someone tells you a story about family history or something that happened in, in Louisiana and it happened in or around New Orleans, don't ever question that it didn't happen. Because it seems to me almost like, I don't want to say it's like an anything goes location and it's always been that way, but stuff is just a little bit different there. Um, and if you've watched the Feast of All Saints and if or if you've read the book, you know about the duality of this, this slave owner having two families, having the black family that lived in the city of New Orleans that he put up, that he took care of, and then having his white family out on the, in the river parishes, right? Operating two 
households, um, one white, one black, paying for the kids to go to school. I mean, all these things. You will find those things in records in New Orleans where you will not find those in, in other places. Um, there's a question from the chat room for Bernice and anyone else that wants to chime in. Um, I think it was Neff asked about, uh, a, can you address the U.S. color troops and reconstruction military in New Orleans? I guess just briefly before we move on to the well, next question. Oh, okay, because I wanted to say something else before oh, I sure. talk yeah. about say, that. Say that, say that and, and then, yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to just talk about the blending of culture in, in Louisiana because you will find French influence, Spanish influence, and African influence, and German uh, influence in New Orleans. And we have, I mean, we are one big gumbo, if you will, because those cultures are blended in such a way that you're going to find something that's very unique in New Orleans that you're not going to find in other places. Even the records that we try to access, you will find some of those records are in French. You will find some of those records in Spanish. Uh, and, you, you know, it may take us all the way back to Bernardo Galvez. And you think about the Haitian Revolution. So you will find that some of us have Haitian roots because of the revolution. But where did the, the Haitians uh, go? To New Orleans. And so we have so much to, uh, to talk about when we talk about the blending of cultures in, in New Orleans. I think that's an important key also to, to think about, especially if you're dealing a certain time periods, right? Because I think usually when mm -hmm. you're when you're thinking in other places in the country, right? You're just like, okay, everything's in English. But right. this area was settled by three distinct populations. And so of course, naturally, the records reflect that three distinct populations were there, right? Certainly. So, you know, so, and 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 they, here's the other piece about this. Don't be short-sighted and think that it's just New Orleans. You have to also factor in Natchez into this as well, because mm -hmm. there are records, once you get past a certain mm -hmm. time period in Natchez, you're dealing with stuff that's in Spanish and you're dealing with stuff that's in English. You, you're not going to have French, but then you might have French if the transaction happened in New Orleans during a certain that's point right. in time, right? So you may that's be dealing right. with three different languages, even though you're dealing with Am American people in record, so to speak, right? Even your enslaved ancestors. I've hit a point with some of my research in the Natchez area where I'm in Spanish records. And thank God for my three years of high school and one year of college <laughs> Spanish, because I may not be as proficient as maybe Ellen, you know, being able to do things fluidly, but I will send things to her so that, you know, just to make sure that my interpretation is correct. Um, and so, you know, then we We've got fluent French speakers on the panel as well, right? So that's something else to consider is that you're going to have to deal potentially with language barriers. So Bernice, can you, because um, there's a couple, there's another okay. question after this one, but she uh, she was asking about the U.S. color troops. The United the States color troops. Okay. So in the beginning of, of the war, you had this group of, of soldiers that were the native guards and they were there, we would say, to maybe be on the Confederate side, but basically they are, they're the Union soldiers. That's, that was really the beginning, the largest group of, of Native Guard soldiers right there in New Orleans. So you will find these very unique records where if you get a United States Color Troop pension file, you will find all kinds of information about them. Some of them will say, you know, I was part of, of Madam Somebody's House, and I joined the, 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 the Native Guard, and this is what I did. And they named the family members that were in the house. They named the witnesses who come in as to uh, provide deposition so the individuals can know who is that person. They're telling you who the person is. They're giving full descriptions of what they did in the war. And then, of course, hopefully they then receive their pensions. But very strong records that I encourage everyone to try to get. I know, Alex, you're looking for a USCT record right now. And look, I, I believe in those files. I spent a lot of time at the National Archives pulling those records. And so, again, this is the record group that you really want to get into, especially those who are out of New Orleans and for that matter, Louisiana. 
Can I jump on that right after you about the USCT? Um, one of the things that, that started me researching my New Orleans deep ancestry was through was about my ancestor Jordan Banks and Noble, who was one of the big spearheads for the um, USCT and the Native Guards. Um, one common misconception about the Native Guards is that many of them were just willingly um, Confederate soldiers, and the unfortunate part is is that yeah, they were. There were they were. there were a few of them that needed that they was protecting their property and all these reasons why Confederates had to be Confederates, right? Um, but there also was a lot of coercion during that time. New Orleans was becoming a very violent hotbed against uh, free people of color and enslaved people. So, in in all honesty, it was kind of like you're going to die by us if you don't kind of join up, but they weren't allowed to have weapons a lot of the time. They weren't given the proper provisions or payment or so on and so forth. So as soon as Butler came in, they was like, here's our, here's our guns. If we have them, here's our, you know, whatever our resources are. Let me tell you guys how this city works. And they also served as spies for the union um, well before they arrived in New Orleans too. Um, one really, really influential um, person that's talked about this is, um, Jari Honore, who could not be on the panel tonight, but um, who's been doing tons of research around that. And a few others really have um, detailed that New Orleans USCT. You will find some great records there. And not only were those those soldiers that were from New or that were in New Orleans during the Civil War, many of them were from outside parishes or states even that had wound up in New Orleans as well. So that's a really big tip for anyone researching their family that way. Okay, um, next question, um, I believe was for Karen. Can you address the movements of people moving west from NOLA to Texas? Sure, um, one of the things I found in some of my research is that a lot of people left Louisiana and moved into Texas. But uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that uh, in those early days, Texas was actually Mexico. And that was really, really part of the Southern Underground Railroad or where there was also a lot of free people of color um, trying to escape some of the oppression um, in South Louisiana and they would move on into Texas slash Mexico. So uh, if you have roots in uh, and you start to do your research, especially looking at some of your DNA research, you'll see that uh, you'll see this uh, westward migration because Texas was a source of freedom for many of our people. Okay, okay. Uh, let's see, next question before we move on, I actually have a couple. Um, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, what is New Orleans doing to protect documents and archives in the city? I don't really have a answer for that one other than the standard operating procedures. I know that um, when you're talking about uh, well, there's a there's the notarial archives that's in sort of like a high rise in downtown New Orleans. And then, you know, the, the conveyance records are also in that same building. Um, you know, I, I, I would say any any standard protocol, to be honest. Um, I remember when the storm happened, most of the people in my family, you know, my mom's side, and even my dad's side were concerned, like, well, what am I going to do if I have to order my birth certificate? Because <laughs> when you are born in any other parish in Louisiana, after your after your 50th birthday, your birth certificate goes to the state central uh, vital records and you have to order it from New Orleans. You can't order it from the parishes. I don't know if they've changed that, but I know that at the time of Katrina, that was what was going on. So people mm -hmm. were were concerned. They were wondering if there was going to be a backlog, backlog or whatever. So I would imagine the standard operating procedure would, would set precedent in those um, situations. Um, and then um, uh, Carmen asked, what was the Turo building? I would imagine Turo, wasn't that Turo the Hospital? Yeah. yeah, is infirmary, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. tour infirmary. Yes, and and a, a very um, interesting fact about Turo is that as uh, as as you as many people know, New Orleans was uh, like the uh, one of the top slave markets in the South, and they would actually send uh, their enslaved people to Turo to get them well enough to go on the auction block. So that's some of the significance of Turo Hospital, a Turo Infirmary. 
And do, and didn't they, ha those records are available for us to research in, right? Because I could have sworn um, maybe a year or two ago, there was a, there were some news articles that were written about searching through the records at Turo Infirmary, correct? Mm. Yeah, I did that as a current, well, we did that as a current event. I'm going to yeah. post a link to where they can get those information. I know you can records. with Charity, but I don't know about Turo. Yeah, Turo, yes. I, I, really I, yes. I remember that because they, we, yeah, True was saying, I was like, we did it as a current event on the show, if, if I remember correctly. So True will dig up that link. Um, and, and here's the thing, if there's nothing that you take away from this episode tonight, what you should realize is that even if your family didn't necessarily, li didn't necessarily live in New Orleans, they, at some point, if they were in the South at some point, they touched it. Like, it's almost impossible. It's like, New Orleans is like an octopus. It's got like eight <laughs> tentacles and it kind of touches a bunch of different places, right? So think of those little suckers that are on the bottom of the octopus where it just goes. <sharp> That's literally what, what New Orleans does, record speaking. Um, so let's go back. We kind of deviated a little bit um, from some of the questions. That's okay. So what other areas uh, was New Orleans part of before statehood, right? We talked about Spanish control. We talked right. about French, talked control. French control, right? We talked about the English coming in with the Louisiana Purchase, right? We're talking about before the Louisiana Purchase, <laughs> exactly, right? So we talked yeah. about that. But something you have to remember: the Orleans Territory hmm. was more than just New Orleans. Right. What other areas did the Orleans Territory encompass? So I would have gone all the way up to past, past Illinois, past what is now Chicago. Yeah. All of that would have been considered part of the Orleans, Orleans territory. And in early records on, um, was there something that's really cool on Ancestry? Uh, you guys correct me if I'm wrong with the correct title, but it deals with Catholic church records. And it has Catholic church oh, records yeah. going all up and down that Orleans territory that actually went back to France um, at some point after France left the U.S. or continental U.S., they took a lot of those records from their territories from their territories back. Many of them um, record slaves up in the like Illinois area on Catholic Church records, and they mention mother, father, godparents, so on and so forth. And that has been an incredible resource um, for my own re for my own research for sure. They're in French, so that's the only drawback. But yeah, but you also have to, you know, also consider Florida, uh, part of Mississippi. Um, so it's it's a broad area. And, you know, right now we have what we call the Florida parishes, where uh, some of my people are from the Florida parishes. But again, as you mentioned, those records, even if you're in the Florida parishes, you may find them in Orleans Parish. And and I found my my great great grandfather's death announced in the Times Picayune newspaper in 1909. But he's from the Florida parishes, mm. so you also have to think about that when you start looking for your information. As Nika said, that information may be in records in New Orleans, especially if they were notarized and you have the notarial archives, which is located in New Orleans. Well, if you know who the notary is, then you may be able to find your actual documents in New Orleans. Karen, care to ch chime in? No, I think that uh, they covered uh, most of the things that I was gonna say. Um, and, and, you know, I just don't want people to also forget the Bayou areas. Uh, you know, in the river parishes, especially the river parishes. Yeah, and and that's something um, I think that you're going to keep hearing repeated over and over again, as, as Karen touched on earlier about, you know, slaveholders having land out in the country, right, or along the river or in other, usually it's kind of a duality, right? You have your business that you take care of in New Orleans, and then you have your, you know, your kind of your, uh, your, your country life that you have, your plantation that you have there. And especially if you identify a slaveholder who had a network of plantations, especially 
especially if you encounter that. Someone who had more than one, some out in the country, maybe some closer into New Orleans. And this is going up as far north as, as Woodville, Mississippi. I talk right. about this all the time, which mm -hmm. is neighboring to the Florida mm -hmm. parishes that Bernice talked about. A lot of those folks would come and handle business in New Orleans. So you're missing a huge opportunity if you have folks who were, you know, in Amite County, Mississippi, those older, the oldest counties that are in the state of Mississippi, Jefferson County, Wilkinson County, Adams County, you are really doing yourself a disservice if you are not looking in New Orleanian records yes. for those folks that were on, were in those locations. Um, that's just something to keep in mind. And something else that I'll also throw out there is if you do make a journey to the notarial archives in New Orleans, it's an amazing space, they will um, provide you with copies of things. They'll take pictures for you, high resolution images um, that are amazing. And what I had noticed was I was looking through a mortgage book that's not even indexed. And the transactions mm -hmm. were by and large, I would say maybe 75% of them were for people who lived in New Orleans and 25% of them were for people who did not. And I'm talking the buyer and the seller were right. not that's people right. who were from New Orleans. Um, right. and, and they're so, so rich. Uh, with information, it's it's amazing. It's, they're especially very rich, when it comes to, especially when it comes to enslaved. The most detailed um, bits of uh, of enslaved ancestor research that I have comes from that notorial office, and it lists. I mean, the it it lists how many slaves were being sold to descriptions of them, what their work was. And especially in New Orleans, which is why New Orleans is such a special place, is the amount of, of, of enslaved Africans there. Not just you know second generation, third generation, the amount of enslaved Africans and the way that they describe them almost to a T um, is really, really, New Orleans is, one, is the only place in the nation that I've been able to research multiple people going back to an original, originally enslaved African ancestor. So that's one way that you can definitely find them. Right, and Alex, just as you said, I mean, you will find a record that says from the Nago Nation. I mean, they're actually saying where they're from in those papers. I mean, it is so rich. I mean, if the archive, the notorial archives is a place that you can just go and pull up one of these big books and sit down and read just to get an understanding of what was happening during that period of time, because the documentation is there. And you also see family meetings where they're talking about how they're distributing some uh, of the, the other. Slaves. Go ahead, Karen. Yes, I just wanted to say that uh, also when you're looking at records in New Orleans, when you began to look at the wills and probate records um, and, and also uh, some of our our ancestors uh, who were free were and even some of those who were not free were trying to get free looking at uh, court records. And uh, I have one particular ancestor, uh, Marguerite Jean-Louis who filed papers to try to save her property along Bayou St. John. I mean, she's someone who was born in 1793 and she owned property along uh, Bayou St. John in New Orleans. And, the, and her records are in the, in the courthouse uh, in New Orleans. Awesome. All right. Well, let me see the next question that I have for the panel and let me check the chat. Um, because they are just flying, flying, flying. Um, someone uh, said West Florida was not part of the Louisiana Purchase. No, it was not. But mm -hmm. a lot of those people who lived in the Florida parishes did business in transactions in New Orleans. In fact, sometimes, um, like I said, there's a duality. So you can't rule out that you need to search for records in New Orleans if you have folks that were in the Florida parishes. Um, let's see. Another question is, um, what were the first peoples, uh, or First Nations tribes that lived in and around New Orleans? Mm. So one of the nearest, most local tribes now is the is the Homa, um, located around Terrebonne in all of those um, swamp parishes. But also you had Chitimachas there, you had um, in some intermingling with Choctaw, um, and then as well as Natchez natives as well. 
and that's and that's not to mention the attack um mm -hmm. who are located mostly around like La, uh, lafayette yeah. saint landry mm -hmm. attack what would be known as the attack district um as well as several others um that after the french especially um the french didn't really deal too well with the with the natives when the spanish stepped in there was um a little less warring going on but there was mass genocide in new orleans around just like um just like the, uh, I'm sorry, just like other portions of the of the country, but many of them ended up blending in with each other. So that's something to keep in mind. I mean, you have like in New Orleans, you have Chapatulis and all these other um, names that are still there. Those are names of native tribes. Uh, next question, um, let's see, I'm gonna scroll down through First Nations people. Um, Okay, we're gonna continue on with getting through the the uh, through the series of questions, and then we'll come we'll come back or uh, prompts, and we'll come back because I don't want it to seem like one person is dominating all the questions. I know you want to get your help, but I want to be make sure that we cover everything that we're gonna talk about tonight as well. So let's talk about historical episodes. What are some of the things that people need to be aware of when they're researching in New Orleans, right? Because we talked about the Civil War, of course, everywhere that's something that's impactful, but let's talk about other historical things that took place in the area that would affect genealogy and family history research. Well, we can't we can't forget the slave trade. I mean, when I you talk that... about the slave the slave ship manifest, you will see large numbers of individuals being moved from Virginia, from Maryland, even from Savannah, from Charleston to New Orleans to the slave markets. And that documentation is available with first and last names. Not only that, but they name the ships, they name when they arrive, they uh, name who the owners are, and you could pretty much track an individual that arrived in New Orleans to determine where did they go. For example, my ancestor, Harriet Watson, born around 1815 in Virginia, was on a slave ship called the Cheyenne. And she was transported in 1849 to New Orleans. I can still find her in records in 1880. And so you can't think about that slave market and the slave trade without thinking about the documentation that you will find in the slave ship manifest. Mm -hmm. Anyone else want to add in there? Um, in fact, uh, Alex, you sent a link over with uh, an example of a manifest. We probably should show this so people could see. So these these are whenever once the once the importation of slaves um, from uh, places outside the U.S. stopped in eighteen what was it eighteen oh eight right mm -hmm. that meant that ships had to document their cargo which included enslaved people so you could not use a ship to transport enslaved people within the United States without documenting them you will find similar manifests in places like Savannah Georgia mm -hmm. uh, but New Orleans remember one hundred and thirty five thousand people were sold in just this one place right so that's something um, to keep in mind so I'm gonna just pulling up the first record and these are on Family Search and um, just to answer a question quickly for Tom. Um, Tom, some of the records that we're talking about are available in Family Search. They're organized very wonkily. Um, sometimes the it just was it probably was like just just microfilm as much as you can probably, but things ended up being put together on rolls where they may not necessarily make sense. And then there are a lot of records that are not microfilmed. I can tell you right now that some of the stuff that I'm going to show you tonight, I have copies of it because I went there and got it. It is not microfilmed and it is not indexed either. So that's a huge mm -hmm. opportunity for Family Search to go in, especially at the notarial archives in. Uh, New Orleans. No, not talking about conveyance records. The conveyance records, those have been, you know, microfilmed many years ago. The notarial archives, which includes stuff from territorial days and pre before that, is not microfilmed. Something else to also keep in mind, normally when you go and do on-site research in locations, you're looking for the seller and the buyer. You're looking at the index that gives you the book and the page for those two people, right? You have a you have an index that goes from, you know, from seller to buyer. Then you have another one that goes from buyer to seller. Remember, I told you 
Louisiana and New Orleans is a different kind of place. When you head to the notarial archives, so this is looking at something pre 1822 ish or so, you need to know who the notary was for the mm -hmm. transaction. Right. Not who the buyer and the seller was, but who the notary was. Why is that important? Family you families used a particular notary. And even after usually sometimes when the notary died, he passed his business on to somebody That's else. Right. And then yeah. you need to know the chain of custodianship over that notary right. business. So if you walk in there saying, I'm looking for, uh, uh, you know, I, what was the man's name we were looking for, Alex? The I can't remember Fitch. yours. It yeah, was, it was, so, it was Collins or somebody. It was, something, something it was like, like the Lonious Fitch. Like it was a name that was like, it sounded like somebody, I don't know. This man just had a very unique name. And so you can do some pre-work and look at the um, Notorial Archives website and pull up the indexes that they generated that were created by the Works Progress Administration. They do have those available. Some of those are typed, but, but the large majority of them are not. Once you find the notary, and here's the thing, don't think, oh, it's only 10 notaries. No, it is not only 10 notaries. It is a bunch of notaries, okay? You you may, if you, especially if you're looking at a, in a location that's away from New Orleans, you may see that a notary's name is mentioned in that transaction. I've seen in my my uh, research that the, the transaction is, is documented locally and it's documented in New Orleans because the actual transaction happened in New Orleans and the people right. came back and, and had it documented locally. Look to see who the notary was that was mentioned there. And then when you go to New Orleans, then look for that same notary. But you can't go in there just looking for a name. Um, it's not gonna crack off. So Tom, if I have any any angel requests that I'm gonna ask for, I'm gonna ask for <laughs> those notarial <laughs> books to get to get microfilmed and scanned. Um, so this is in the set of records. This is a ship manifest coming into New Orleans, and it mentions a list of slaves um, by um, by the Brigadier Ajax uh, William Smith Master from Norfolk. Um, aimed at New Orleans, Saturday afternoon, November 19th, 1831. The said slaves are shipped by James Diggs and consigned to C.W. or C.M. Diggs and by him introduced and interested for sale in the city of New Orleans within 30 days. So what we have here is, is a couple of different transactions. You have two people with the last name Diggs who are transacting these enslaved people. They could be relations. I would imagine they probably are, maybe a set of brothers, first cousins, whatever. Um, and then it says that these 30 people are going to be sold in New Orleans. And look at this. This is literally just the first set of records that I pulled off this link that Alex sent me over. You've got a name of an enslaved person, age, sex, complexion, counties of their residence. So this tells you, this particular set of records tells you that Lavina came from Craven County, North Carolina, but then Bartlett, a 50 year old male underneath her came from Petersburg City, Virginia. And you have other people from Craven County. So I would potentially in this case, research all the Craven County people and see if they came from the same plantation or the same slaveholder. You've right. got Nanzamond, Virginia, uh, you've got Gates County, North Carolina, or Gates. It's it's a Persimmons. You've got a lot of different stuff here. Okay, so this is one of the records that we were just talking about, which is a slate, which is a ship manifest. Nika, All can right, you touch on that really quick. Sure. So, so I think that that's. Can I also chime in on the manifest? Oops. Yes, uh, Alex, go ahead and let um and let Miss Karen talk. Um, no, ma'am. A little bit delayed. No, no, <laughs> ma'am. That's a New Orleans native. She gets precedence over me. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Go, Ms. Karen. <laughs> yes, I, I just wanted to chime in uh, on the manifest. It's such a, a rich bounty of those manifests also available in that book, Cash for Blood. Uh, it lists um, uh, a lot of the stories. That, there it is. There it is. Of the Baltimore to New Orleans slave trade. I found that book to be so helpful. And you will find that many of the enslaved people in that book have first has have last names as well. And uh, it's just a really, really helpful book. Um, and, and also, I wanted to chime in on other historical events that uh, have an impact on researching our uh, uh, people of color in New Orleans, and we can't leave out the Haitian Revolution because uh, the population of New Orleans more than doubled, and and uh, 
formerly enslaved people were brought back in to Louisiana uh, by their slave masters who were run out of, of Haiti. Uh, and so uh, that has a big impact on our research. And, and of course, many of us, as we do our research, we find that we have Haitian roots as well. That would be me. <laughs> Alex, exactly. what were you gonna say about the manifest? Um, so about the so so it does it was gonna tie into that to that Haitian Revolution and then also a really really cool bit of detail that's almost unknown. Um, so with the manifest, so those are mostly covering a period from about 1830 to like the 1850s, and I think maybe it, they touch on 1860. I have not gone through each of these. But Bernice was also pointing out that they're on Ancestry and on Ancestry, you can search by that full name. Um, so they're completely indexed for the most part. Um, a second part of that manifest is, is if you look about a week or so after that ship lands, the newspaper article will come out oftentimes in the Times Democrat was really big on selling on um, slave auctions. The Picayune, not so much, but the Times Democrat during that time posted slave auctions and probate sales all the time. Um, and oftentimes they'll list all of those slaves as well. So then you can see kind of like when you need to search for that, if you wanna see who purchased the slave off of um, that ship or off, out of that sale, you can say, okay, well, it'll be around this time. It was done at this auction house or at, in New Orleans, they call auction houses coffee houses sometimes. That's some weird New Orleans stuff, but you can look there and figure out which one. And that's how you're going to find your notary too, and figure out where your people were sold to. A second, a third part of that, y'all know I'm long with it and I'm sorry. Um, the, there's also manifests um, that would just be open to everyone, um, ever, all ethnic groups. But a lot of people from New Orleans left when New Orleans became this really, really terrible racial hotbed. Um, a lot of free people of color actually left New Orleans and went to a little place called Eureka, Mexico, um, which is located around Veracruz. And their ship um, documentation about that, about tons of folks going there and finding that founding this Eureka colony, which failed, um, and then coming back. And then also many of them going to Haiti also. So many people of color left to Haiti. And usually this was the French and Spanish, um, you know, speaking folks, but it, that is still something that many folks can trace their ancestry to for sure. Okay. All right. That's great information. Um, so we talked about historical episodes and we, we've been hitting on the positives of researching in, in New Orleans. Are there any drawbacks? I don't see that there are. I'm biased though. <laughs> don't give me the lion bernice you're muted and karen karen let's let karen go first are there yeah. any drawbacks i don't see any drawbacks no, I'm sorry. No, no i have not seen any drawbacks because we have such a, a variety of records um you know especially i mean you could just go to our main library on loyola avenue and you can have access to uh, Times Picayune newspaper records and obituaries and uh, the uh, Sacramento records books. And uh, I was even inquiring about prison records last week, not prison, arrest records last week. And uh, with some, even though they're in bad shape, but you could get special permission to take a look at the arrest records uh, from New Orleans. So it's just such a rich bevy of records. I, I have not found any drawback so far. I haven't either. And uh, Dante brings up, he talks about Austin Woolfolk. Well, if you have the book Cash for Blood, it talks about Austin Woolfolk, who was a major slave trader in Baltimore, along with one of my favorite people, a man named Bernard Moore Campbell, who was also a part of the slave trade from uh, Baltimore down to uh, New Orleans. In fact, Bernard Moore Campbell, you know, we're having conversations about reparations. He was actually selected by Congress to evaluate the enslaved people in D.C. so their owners could be compensated for them. Mm. He also he also sold the wife of my great great grandmother from Baltimore down to New Orleans, and the slave owner purchased her in New Orleans. But the transaction, but this in, the enslaver lived in North Louisiana. So you had someone from Carroll Parish buy a slave from someone from Baltimore in New Orleans. That often happened. 
So that that's that's kind of that's kind of where we're going. Um, Bernice, what did you want to chime in on uh, drawbacks? We are we already have illuminated the millions of positives. I mean, gosh, Bernice, unmute yourself. You're still muted, Bernice. I'm not going to say it's a drawback. What I am going to say, though, is that we have a rich arsenal of runaway slave ads in New Orleans. And when I began to do my research in New Orleans, I went to the Williams Research Center. And there I wanted to just, just tell me about the, the runaway slaves. And they provided me with uh, volumes of documentation of individuals that were trying to run away and gave detailed descriptions. And this is the one thing that you will find. You will find the slave owner. You will find the price tag. You will find the name of the person, when they left, who they left with, where they might be hanging out. It's all in the newspaper. And so, you know, I just want to tell people, this is something that we're going to talk about at the Midwest African American Genealogy Institute. Because if we ignore the runaway slave ads, you're missing something. You're missing a lot of information that can tell you a lot about the community, what was going on, what kind of price they put on the heads of people. And some of these uh, runaway slave ads have young women, young men, they have couples running away together. I mean, this is a fantastic resource for everyone to take a look at. Karen? Yes, I want to also uh, mention uh, uh, the runaway slave ads are a big part of the Purchase Life Lives exhibit, which is at the Illinois Holocaust Museum. And that was initially uh, opened up by the historic New Orleans collection, which uh, the Williams Research Center is a part of. And I think it's that book, uh, Help Me to Find My Family, which also mm -hmm. depicts many of the runaway slave ads. But if you have not seen the Purchase Lives exhibit, Exhibit, and you are anywhere near the uh, Holocaust Museum in Illinois, I would encourage you, it's worth the trip to see it. Yeah, and something else we also need to factor in too is religion and its role in enslaved people's lives and free people's lives, right? The Catholic Church is a huge resource, especially if you have ancestors where you're lucky enough for your people to be Catholic. None of mine were. Um, mine were Baptists and Methodists, and they weren't even owned by Catholics. But if you happen to have a Catholic slaveholder, right, and you have potentially you have cer certain surnames like Queen and Hawkins, and <laughs> you know you can keep going on and on. You may be part of the Georgetown University. Um, situation or GU 272, but those sacramental records that we talked about earlier, those big old blue books by Father Hebert, uh that document births, uh, baptisms, marriages. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, if you go to the um, Whitney Plantation, that's where that there's a whole monument to babies that died in slavery. And that's where they pulled a lot of those records was from the Father Abraham books or the sacramental books. Um, something else we have to also bring up, and you know, we may think that this is this is, you know, a newbie thing, are Dr. Gwendolyn Midlow Hall's records, uh, Louisiana uh, slave records that are in a database on ancestry. I didn't think that I had any relatives or ancestors in those, and I found them myself. Yes, I got that Afro Creole book too. I got that one too. Yeah, we all got we all got the same book. It's like if we, it, it reminds I have two me of, of them. Exactly. It reminds me when, we, when me and my husband got married. And you know, when you get married, you have to consolidate, right? So I imagine perhaps when Bernice got married, they had to consolidate records. So if you had to, you, you would have two records of the same thing, right? Like if you both really like Fats Domino, Blueberry Hill, you guys might have two Blueberry Hills. Well, we had to consolidate CDs. So there were a whole bunch of CDs that we have. So if we all ended up living together in the same old folks home, we would all have the exact same book. We'd have four <laughs> copies of the exact same <laughs> book. So we do have to bring that up. Gwendolyn Midlow Hall's books on colonial Louisiana, amazing resources. Um, Something I wanted to show um, before um, I forgot to do it, and this is these are these are copies of records that I got at the notarial archives because I just want everyone to see. Um, let's see, I want to make sure I have the right one. Okay, there we go. 
So this is a record that I had uh, one of the, the staff there pull for me at the notarial archives. And the reason why I pulled it was I was literally going page by page in this book because these records are not indexed. Remember, I could have had the scenario where I knew the notary and then the notary would have then led me to the book and the page, right? But in this scenario with these mortgage books, these are completely separate than the conveyance books. And I did not know that they existed until I went there. I was flipping page by page and I actually found my ancestor slaveholder with other with, a, with another transaction. Notice it says territory of Orleans, parish of Avoyas. This is not Orleans. This is documented in Orleans. The records are sitting in Orleans, but this particular transaction has to do with the Voice Parish. And it talks about on the third day of March in the year of our Lord, 1,809, before me, Thomas F. Oliver, judge of said parish, exercising the powers and performing the duties of the notary public in the said parish, personally appeared to me, Isaac H. Robinette of Wilkes County in the Commonwealth of North Carolina, the one part, and Richard Graham of the said parish parish of the other part. This is documented in, or this, the, this book sits in Orleans Parish. So that's something that you need to keep in mind, right? Remember, don't be short-sighted. If you have folks that are in South Louisiana or really any area of Louisiana, you need to be looking in New Orleans. Um, there's another record that I was also going to show you all um, that I loved as well. And this one is in French. <laughs> so don't make fun of me, Alex. In my loose translation. <laughs> <laughs> but this one I pulled because this is documented um, in Orleans Parish. Looks like uh, the 8th of, of, of August, 1810. And it mentions a homme libre de color domiciled in uh, in set in Ligos News. It looks, he declares that he uh, is presents uh, that he's legitimate, that legitimately the heir of maybe of Charlotte Bellou, a femme libre de color. So these are free people of color in this document. And it looks like their last name is Marigouin. What? You, oh, sorry. Did, did some, who, who said that? I said that. <laughs> no, it sounds, <laughs> it sounds like Marigouin. And I'm yeah. just wondering if it's the small, you know, that Marigwin has a very special place. It's a very special place to me yes. uh, regarding the uh, GU-272. That's the people who were sold by the Jesuits of Georgetown. Yes. And well, this, this is Matthew I see. Mm -hmm. I see. And yes. anytime that name is mentioned, I, you know, my ears perk up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, I, hey, I I just pulled this one because I wanted people to see that um, that there are records for free people of color. Notice these free; these are free people, right? And as early as 1810. And I, when I saw this when I was there, I was like, oh, we've got this episode coming up. This would be great to show people that you can actually go and pull um, and pull this. So um, let's see, hold on, let me show that. Cause Mammy, Mammy's is cutting up in the chat room. She's sharing a whole bunch of links <laughs> to the Amistad Research Center, which, oh, Amistad, oh my gosh, where do you even start with Amistad? Um, in fact, I was looking at records for Amistad, um, the American Missionary Association. I was actually looking for records for them operating in Canada. Those records, are at the Amistad Research Center in New Orleans. I feel like everything that I'm researching and everywhere, it always ends up somehow in New Orleans. Maybe it's because we just know how to take care of stuff. I don't know. Well, you know, we don't throw anything out. We we <laughs> save all our old stuff. Um, and so it, it, I think people understand that their records will be safekeeping. We don't like to change very easily. Uh, so that maybe that's why. <laughs> Alex, what would yeah, you like to Yeah, and also Amistad... Amistad has special collections. One of our uh, good friends, Antoinette Harrell, has the Antoinette Harrell collection at the Amistad. And I remember when I went over there, I said, well, let me see what's in uh, Antoinette's uh, collection and found my young blood ancestors in there. So, you know, we also have to look at special collections in different places. Even Dillard University has special collections. And so, Think about the universities, think about the resources they have and go in there with, with at least a, a research plan 
of what you're looking for and what you're hoping to gather. Because while you mention the Catholic Church, you also have to mention, look at the Methodist Church, the Church of God in Christ, and the Baptist churches. They also have documentation in various places. Dillard University is a Methodist university. Amistad may have the Church of God in Christ records. So think, when you think religion, think very broadly as far as where you might find documentation. And yeah. I know of one church, it's called Grace United Methodist Church. It was started by a group of free people of color. So you want to go to some of these old Methodist churches and find their church histories because the church histories do identify the people that started those churches. And that church was started in the right, a red light district in New Orleans. It's no longer uh, active because it's now First Grace United Methodist on Canal Street. But keep in mind, you have all of these various religious groups that you want to go to and find records about people of color in New Orleans. That's very true. Anything you want to chime in with, Alex, before I get to your laundry list of uh, of links? Going to get to the links. Going to get to the links. <laughs> <laughs> Well, before you get we to the links, the can we record. just also mention the, the yearbooks and one particular yearbook is McDonald 35, one of the oldest public uh, schools in, in New Orleans. In they the have state. wonderful, <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. and they have uh, beautiful yearbooks. I mean, it's, it's just something that I love looking at their yearbooks. But of course, we also have Xavier Prep and we have St. Mary's and we have Saint some Aug. of the other schools. Yes. Yes. So all of these Holy schools crawl. have, I mean, people sometimes may not look at the, the yearbooks as a resource, but the yearbooks include histories. You know, my mother used to talk about the principal of McDonald 35. Well, this is somebody that you want to read up about. And most of the public schools in New Orleans all were named after historically black individuals. So you'll find Phyllis Wheatley, you'll find Felina C. Jones, you'll find George Washington Carver and Booker T. Washington. I mean, all of those schools are there and they all have histories and they make sure that the students know the history of the person that that school is named after. That's history. <laughs> Definitely. Nika, real fast before you go to the to the laundry list of, of, of links, one of the things that I find in, in my research, New Orleans is basically, New Orleans and the River Parishes are my main um, sites of research. So one of the things that I love about it the most is that you can track a life cycle in New Orleans almost, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know any other place that you can literally track someone's life from beginning to end and the, re and the second line. You know, you you really can, and um, the, <laughs> that the is such there. a great quote. That was, I'm nice. sorry, that was a great quote. Nice. You can uh. you can try, you can trace somebody's life from beginning to end and the second line. If you know what a second line is, that makes sense because that means that those are all the affiliated people who were connected to the deceased. Yes, yes. Great quote, Truly. Alex. Great quote. So, so I say that all to say there is a ton of things in New Orleans that affected every person in that city, especially the black people. And whether you was an uptown Negro or you downtown Negroes, the fact is, is that you were affected by a lot of the things in the city and the city passed a lot of laws to adapt to the way that black people adapted to the, the into, to that climate, to the, to the political and racial climate there. Um, I mean, like I said, the second lines are, are one of those adaptations. So you need to look into almost every facet of that city. I just wanted to shout out a couple um, really, really huge influences that have affected me in my research. And probably one of the reasons why I'm around today. Um, for one, we have one of them on this panel, Miss Bernice. Um, and then Greg Osborne, Jari Honore, Cornell Celestine. There's a really great group that you can tap into if you're doing on-site research in Louisiana. Hit up Cornell Celestine and Diane Honore, Lonera Gobert, and a few others um, that are there in New Orleans, especially a man named Greg Osborne, who sits behind a desk at the Orleans <laughs> Public uh, Library. He will help you and walk you through all of those if you're a beginner. He will tell you all the steps and where to get lunch at when you're break. He don't let you get thirsty. 
He don't let you move into that library, but he will make sure that you find your folks in one day for real. So I'm yes, a, yes. That I'm main that main library, time. the main library downtown is a gym. Um, because honestly, I feel like it's more advantageous to go there as a researcher than to go to the state archives in some in some instances in Baton Rouge because you've got microfilm from all over the state in the New Orleans Public Library. Um, that you don't even have at, at the start, state archives, which makes no sense to me. I don't understand that, but hey, that's okay. Cause I love, I love the downtown library. Um, something else that, um, that we need to um, consider cemeteries, people just like you have your churches, right? We talked about cemeteries a lot on this show. People, family are buried together. Communities are buried together. So you're gonna see a lot of things um, duplicated in the in the dead world as you would uh you know in the living world so that's something to keep in mind um something else that i want to kind of uh, talk about as well especially if you're when you're starting to look through the catalog of records on family search and you're trying to figure out um what is what alex provided that link to the um ship manifest and I just want to I just want to show you all when you go in and search for the film or fiche number on Family Search, what else is on this role? And this is this is what kind of justifies me saying that it literally it seems like I don't know why in New Orleans stuff was just hodgepodge together and I I don't want to say it was cobbled, but it was just like the most random records <laughs> um, are included on these rolls of microfilm. So when you find something that you're interested in come outside of the uh, regular interface where you're looking at just the long list based on the location and put in the roll of microfilm into the, the film and fiche number and see what else is on um, that particular roll of microfiche just to see what's there. So um, he shared with me, right, what we were looking at were the slaves arrived in New Orleans, 1831. Then there's cemetery records for city cemetery. There's Lafayette Cemetery, number one and number two. Register of deaths and interments at Bayou St. John Cemetery. Then there's passenger lists of vessels arriving at New Orleans, 1822, 1851, right? So notice these are not sequential. And then you've got baptismal record of Pierre Julian, a free Negro in, 18, in 1820. All of these things are on this particular roll of microfiche. Now, some of them make sense because they're burial things, but then some of them don't because they're ships. So, you know, I suggest coming over to, you know, and searching, you know, putting the fiche number in for whatever you have and seeing what else is on that microfilm roll um, just because you just should. Um, all right, so getting to Alex's laundry list, um, you've got your usual records like marriages. Um, there's also this hidden record set on Family Search. Do not ask me. I, I'm telling y'all, don't ask me why it's like this. I don't know why. Okay? Ask Tom. T Tom. Tom don't know. Tom, <laughs> Tom don't know. I'm not saying Tom is dumb, but I'm just saying Tom don't know why the folks <laughs> microfilm that stuff okay. like that. Um, there are, so it's a weird set of records. I don't, I don't know why this is. Let me share the screen again so you guys can see this. Cause we had a, we had a weekend where everything was just a free for all and we loved it. Uh, family search time. I know we wasn't supposed to have it, but we had it at home. We wasn't supposed to have it that weekend. I know Bernice remembers that cause I called her in a frenzy. Said, girl, the records is open. <laughs> and one of the things, <laughs> one of the things that I noticed was that this Orleans Parish Vital Records from 1900 to 1964, it included birth certificates for the whole state of Louisiana in the years 1914, 1915. So I'm telling y'all, you need to really stop being short-sighted and thinking, oh, it's, it's New Orleans. Something else to consider as well, when you're looking through Freedmen's Bureau records and you're looking through labor contracts, a lot of times the labor contracts will be listed with Orleans Parish, even though the actual contracts did not take place in Orleans Parish. So don't rule something out and say that it's not an option because it says New Orleans on it. We talked about that a lot. Um, <laughs> Tom said that it's not his fault. The stuff is hodgepodge. <laughs> and, but he says he'll make it his problem. 
Oh, Ooh. I like that. I'm laughing at Angela because we sure did get away we with some up. big time. We cut stuff. up. We found, we found out the fountain was open on Family Search, meaning that stuff that you shouldn't be able to access at home, you can access it. Once we found out the fountain was open, I was calling everybody, going, "Y'all, y'all, don't tell nobody. <laughs> <laughs> y'all can't tell me I didn't call y'all like this." Yeah, they didn't left the records open. You better go. You better hurry up and go. So I call Bernice. I call Angela. I call Ber- Shelly. We all on the phone hollering. Girl, oh my God, you see they got the sauce. Okay, I got to go. I got to get off the phone. And we literally spent the whole week and we sure did. And they shut yeah. the fountain off after about three or four days. It was beautiful. We loved every <laughs> single day of that. Loved it. Um, Yes. And so let's see. Yeah. Lord, uh, Christopher Smother says, I found all my folks on labor contracts in Orleans Parish. I'm telling you guys, they're mislabeled. For some reason, mm-hmm. I don't know why all of Louisiana went to Orleans Parish, but every single parish is like that. Um, <laughs> Kristen, we need a phone tree when stuff like that happens. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> to include you guys anything else we could think of um besides the general i mean you know we 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 don't want to do the records that we know that you guys are going to find right these are your new orleans literally births marriages and deaths in new orleans those stuff are that stuff is widely available it's easy to find on ancestry on family search um the birth indexes go from 1790 roughly to 1915. Um, there's another uh, index that you can use on the state archives website. Um, they've got uh, images of the actual birth records. I've pulled a lot of those for people in my family. Um, you know, just just getting them because um, you have the index record, but you want the actual certificate because you want to be thorough. Um, Louisiana Death Index um, that goes all the way up to 1968 on the. Um, the Louisiana State Archives website, but you can actually get to deaths up to, I think, was a 65 on uh, 60. I'm sorry. You can get, you can get deaths up to 60 on family search. And if you go to the family history center, you can actually pull the certificates. Usually what I do is I usually head there on Thursdays and I have my source box saved. And so anything that I want to pull on a Thursday, I save that to my source box for Thursdays at the family history center. So then I can just pull them when I get there. Um, You've got deaths from 1818 to 1835 that are colored, 1835 to 1840 that are colored. Those are on family search. Those are dealing with free people of color in particular you know, you may also find maybe deceased um, enslaved folks as well. Um, Police department certificates of death for Locust Grove Cemetery. Those are available on on family search. These are all things. It's it's a hodgepodge. If you probably go to the car catalog, you probably may not find it um, because it's not there. Oh, the Times Picayune. We ain't even really... I can go into a full shout over the Times Picayune because they were publishing, to me, they were publishing obituaries for black folks before when other people started doing it. I'm talking, I found, you know, death records for folks or obituaries in the 40s, 30s, even earlier for uh, for uh, black folks in New Orleans. If you do not have a genealogy bank subscription, I highly suggest you get one just for the Times Picayune because those go, they the full text of the newspaper goes until 1991. And we talked ad, ad nauseum about the beautiful Times Picayune obituary and the gold standard that was set <laughs> the Times yeah. Picayune. Hey. Where where you got your standard you got name. The benevolent society and yes, all that. the benevolent society is there. You better the tell us who Gertrude Gettys is. Come on now, okay? <laughs> or or you know whoever else you gonna use? That was my that was my uh, folks uh, and Glapion. That's my folks funeral home, right? So those are there. Uh, St. Vincent Cemetery cemeteries are a big deal, and I know it. Sh- Times Picayune was recently sold. I just saw Jarvis DeBerry tweet today that he was writing his last column. I'm have feeling some type of way because the folks that uh, that own the Advocate bought the Times Picayune and Louisiana Weekly. Of course, you know if you want to get the goods on what was going on in the black community, you definitely want to hit the Louisiana Weekly. Um, that's a great uh, resource. Uh, Data Weekly. Um, what else am I forgetting? We're, the we're New Orleans the Tribune. Was- New Orleans Tribune, the absolutely. Tribune, definitely mm-hmm. the Tribune, mm-hmm. right? And don't forget the social and pleasure clubs. Of course. Young Men of Illinois. Don't forget the uh, Knights of Peter Claver. Don't forget the uh, Zulu Club. Not to mention all of the uh, the Masons and the 
we got them. But <laughs> the I documentation know, is there. Really mean when y'all say pleasure cups, because we mean pleasure. What do you think we, we mean? We mean call them. You know, we mean pleasure. And pleasure. We mean pleasure. <laughs> Social and pleasure clubs. Pleasure. That's what the sign said. You know? Okay, I had the sidebar. <laughs> oh my gosh! So, even, so, even uh, the no. can we, can we all? Even, yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Go ahead, Alex. Can we also talk about um, one of the amazing benefits of the of the Picayune, and then the other um, the other newspapers there too, with the newspaper.com, Chronicle in America, and Genealogy of Bank subscription. If you type in an address that your family lived at, come on now, you are about to open the damn flood. Excuse, ooh, I'm so sorry, <laughs> the flood rate. <laughs> but, but you're right. You're right. So you right. type in the address and everything pops up because you all of the neighbors. Like, yeah. If, if you type in just an obituary for someone, you know, say somebody lived to be about 90 something years old. Now she didn't live through, you know, all these floods. She didn't got her addresses changed on her eminent domain. They built the super dome on her house. All that. Come on. She's living in New Orleans East now and she grew up uptown. Y'all. Yeah. We missing a whole bunch of stuff You're that right. went down in that house. The house been burnt down. Somebody then got shot. Somebody got <laughs> arrested for speeding. Somebody, all this stuff. I could not locate the whereabouts of a particular cousin for years until just a couple of weeks ago. I typed in 2504 Jackson Avenue. And <laughs> here he come. He didn't did a hit and run. <laughs> That's why I couldn't locate him. So, yes. you know, you guys, you got to use utilize that. And also New Orleans is notorious for street name changes and number changes. And there's mm -hmm. some really good sources in the document that, N that Nika has. It has really, really good resources on how to track down those houses. Property in Louisiana and New Orleans for Black people is so vital and important to the sole existence of your family. And you're able to track that and plot their every move just by way of where they live. Not even too many other details, but by who they, by where they live, you can open a floodgate of information about your ancestors, most recent and early. Well, and that's 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 totally speaking to the culture there. I mean, you ask somebody where you, well, where you stay. You know, like that's that's natural, right? And so that's naturally reported in the paper. I've done that too. I've searched for 1931 Tupelo Street. Come on now. That's in New Orleans. That's in the lower nine, right? And and I just to see what what else happened at Buzz's house. You know, and and I ironically, my mother talked in addresses to me when she referred to her aunts and uncles' homes. So that's why I remember those particular houses is because my mother would she wouldn't say she was at Muzz's house, she would say she was at 1931 Tupelo Street. That that would be her thing. Um, let's see um, what else. Uh, Christopher says Submit Mason um, has wonderful periodicals that have a plethora of info about your Submit Mason and Longshoreman ancestors. Um, I have an uncle that was a Longshoreman there. A few other family members who are Longshoremen um, in New Orleans. Um, someone mentioned the Afro Creoles book um, that was mentioned in the chat. Um, Alex, did you put that in there, or do you remember? I'm trying to scroll up to see where you mentioned that. Which um, any other questions? You guys get that out. Get all you get all you can. You got the New Orleanian folks here. Yeah. Um, and I just want to mention this is a journal. It's called La Creole, a journal of Creole history and genealogy. And also another group is La Comity. And this is the the it's now online once you join. But La, La Rocketeer, it has great historical information in here. And so individuals in Louisiana are interested in Louisiana, you want to consider joining La Comité so that you could get the wonderful research that Judy Rufo and others have put into this particular journal. Oh, we can't forget um, Facebook. Uh, we, uh, I, I'm a part of uh, the Southwest Louisiana Creoles, a part of a gene, uh, genetic cousin, and uh, there are various Facebook groups that are related to areas around Louisiana. But uh, remember, those of us who have roots in New Orleans, we have also roots in these uh, other parishes around Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And so connecting in real time uh, with others who have the same research interests is uh, very important. Absolutely. Can we talk about that really fast? Um, part of the 
part of with with Louisiana in particular is that Louisiana, we and today we know Louisiana as this um, this flood ground in a way. But there's a couple of specific, very very specific events that happens that brings a lot of Louis, like a large portion of Louisiana into New Orleans, right? So you have people coming from the river parishes, as as Miss Karen was talking about um, earlier. You have them coming at one point in a huge wave between the tens and twenties into New Orleans proper. Many of them settled near each other, so you'll see that, and many of them maintain those family roots and connections even after moving there, and they do to this day. Um, you have people coming from Baton Rouge and Point Capay moving into New Orleans, people from Natchitoches and St. Landry moving into New Orleans. So keeping that in mind that a lot of these people would have been grouped together, they would have went to the same schools, churches, and so on and so forth, but they added a very, very specific influx into New Orleans, just like the Haitian um, revolution, revolution did when they all moved to the Marigny and Trimé. So, you know, keeping that in mind. Yeah, yeah I would oh. also add too that um, when you're thinking about the Great Migration as well, don't just think about Great Migration in terms of people from Louisiana went to Chicago and went to Michigan and went to California. Also remember the Great Migration included people who were in the Deep South who migrated to New Orleans, Absolutely. right? So just like Karen talked about earlier, she, she thought I was, I'm deep in New Orleans. And then she found out, well, her folks were, you know, they were River Parish's folks, right? Same thing. I think of Miss Doty, um, Karen, that, that, that is, you know, tried and true, got a New Orleanian accent and everything. Her family is from Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> she, in fact, her, her, I think her son was like, and you know, the, the, the generation after her were the first ones actually born in New Orleans, right? <laughs> Same thing with Jean. They all have accents, but our family's from North Louisiana. They're, they, I mean, yes, they're from New Orleans, but you know what I mean? You got to remember there was, there was a migration of people during several periods of time. And you also have to factor in during the forties and the fifties, the great migration shifted those folks in the deep South to uh, uh, the next major city, which would have been New Orleans. Miss Karen, you had something. Yeah. I, and I just want to say, though New Orleans is a part of the South, we are more like our own little country. Um, mm -hmm. And so while people may have experienced, I guess, more harsh, deep uh, oppression in some of the uh, smaller towns, a lot of them found freedom in New Orleans, a way to just free to be who you are. They found that in New Orleans. And that is why they left some of those little country towns and came to the big city. Of course, you know, they found some trouble in New Orleans too, but we ain't gonna talk about that. Well, Karen, you're right, but you also found a large number of entrepreneurs. We, we had our own photography studios there. We had our own funeral homes and not to mention just the corner stores that we had i <laughs> mean you go in the problems. neighborhoods and you had these little corner stores you know but that was what made new orleans special for for black people because you know what if you don't want me hey my whole neighborhood would come up and they would be a little business within themselves but that's the way new orleans was and still is in some places i mean definitely the photographer studios alex and i were talking about my grandmother was in a uh, a photo and he found other pictures where his grandmother was at the same studio. Well, we have that and it's, it is something for us to talk about because something was going on at that particular point in time in the lives of people in New Orleans. They had to have their own because we were not allowed to go to other places. Jim Crow was alive and well and yes, we had to create our own community uh, businesses to do what we needed to do. Well, and the other thing I will say in reaction to that, too, is the learning about the movement there. Gene said that it took a while for stuff to stick because people were so comfortable going where they were going until they had to keep reintegrating spaces. So like they didn't just, you know, I think it's in Gen Xers, younger people have this whole idea that like they went and integrated things and it just stuck. No, actually, they had to keep going back in order to set the precedent so that they wouldn't break the, the chain so that other folks would feel comfortable about going into those locations that they were previously not welcome in. So that that's something um, to consider. Um, yes, Dried's Aretha Castle Haley Hi. in terms of the names of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of the streets. Uh, Miss Karen mentions that Jean's Po' Boys is closing. We are... Ugh. Lord, we could spend a whole other episode talking about what's happened post Katrina, New Orleans. Lord, well, ain't there no more. <laughs> okay, ain't there no more. 
Lord. Um, just Katrina in general. Um, I've often talked about this um, and just the impact that, that, like that was another mass migration. We talk about the great migration. We also have to talk about how the dynamics and the demographics of the, of, and the culture in some ways has shifted in New Orleans post Katrina and how all of these people are living in, in different locations now. And they're bringing their New Orleanian culture foods. In fact, when you go to Maggie, um, there is a, there's a three rivers festival that happens in Fort Wayne every year, just right around when we have uh, Maggie. And I like to go to the food trucks there. And there is a man that is living in Fort Wayne, Indiana, that is from New Orleans that started a food truck. And he has, the food is so good. <laughs> I like going to it. But that is, think about it. He's now in Indiana as a result of Hurricane Katrina. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think of Bernice's sister who's, who lives by me now. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, it's, 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 yeah, it's a lot. Well, um, almost uh, much of my family, uh, we evacuated to Texas together and my household on my Richard line was the only household who came back. And, 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 and it's really heartbreaking to be, uh, uh, I feel like some of those who were left behind, uh, not that we were left behind. Actually, we chose to come back and many of our relatives found a better life in other places, but it does leave a vacuum of um, family support because in New Orleans, uh, our people didn't move away as much as in other places. You had multiple generations living in the same household for multiple generations. And Katrina was, uh, for my family, the first time some of my relatives, I'm talking about my relatives who lived in a, once lived in a desired housing project. Uh, this is the first time our folks left and stayed away. That part of my family was totally uh, broken up. And, and that's just my family, many different families. Our families went away. So I think that it is also important for those of us who are interested in family history that we document uh, that period of uh, outward migration um, because for future generations, it's just gonna be so important to know, people are gonna wanna know what happened to my family during Katrina. And, and you know, you have to also weigh if people especially if they were under traumatic circumstances, right? Like let's say hypothetically someone was at the Superdome or at the convention center and they, they eventually got out and they ended up in another location. They may have had a traumatic experience just like someone who was sold in slavery, right? Yes. And, and they may choose not to even impart on their younger generations about the history that they had in mm -hmm. New Orleans. I mean, think about it, right? Yes. Like you have that you have this horrible experience. You you know, and this is why a lot of young people don't really know. Like like you talked to my family's from Louisiana. Well, where? Well, because there was trauma associated with either leaving or the experience at that location. The family mm -hmm. members don't pass that down, and then here you are, two or three generations out, and nobody even knows New Orleans. They just know Louisiana. So I would I would encourage everyone who is watching the show if you know someone who survived Katrina, if you yourself did, or if you recall people coming into your community who you know came by way of that storm, we really need to start documenting those stories. And I would imagine perhaps maybe a project needs to be started leading up to maybe the 15th or the 20th anniversary mm -hmm. um, to, to catalog what happened because there were so many things. I think the only chronicle that we really truly have is Spike Lee's documentaries about you know, uh, when the levees broke and if God is willing, the creek don't rise, like where you've got all of that time where you are talking to people who were on the ground, who were there, who were around, who saw everything, um, you know, but but that's that's an aspect of our history that we could be documenting now. Um, anything else before we move into Ask Mariah? Because it's a brief well, Ask Mariah. I just wanted to say that what we probably need to do is an oral history project on the uh, Katrina outward migration. Well, just old, on Katrina, period, but for the express purposes of documenting uh, how our families were dispersed. That's very real. I think that it's also interesting that we don't have, so if you're like me and your family was flooded out and so in one of the um, great Mississippi River floods in um, Wilkinson County, Mississippi, and moved down mm -hmm. into um, New Orleans, there was nothing on my great grandmother's side that I and my siblings and my first cousins are the only survivors of that whole family line. Most of them were literally wiped out. Um, and 
unfortunately, we don't have any oral history about that. My grandmother grew up mostly in California, so she didn't know about that storm, and her mother refused to talk about what she knew about that storm and that, or the, and with that flood. So what happens is you now have three generations, now four generations removed from it and some distance, so we'll never get that back. So it is very important to document all of it. There has been a few um, organizations in New Orleans that are taking um, a lot of notes, but unfortunately, some of the things that you have to deal with is navigating people's trauma that don't that don't have it in them to come forward and tell their stories. Also, a lot of my friends, so mo many of my best friends are from New Orleans that lived through Katrina as kids, and they are like, no, nah, we don't deal with that. And we definitely ain't for that talking to people that didn't go through it. So it's a hard thing to navigate. Well, th that's a, that's, but that's also more than just this particular story, right? Because that's the one thing about New Orleans that I love is that people in, in that are from New Orleans that are trying to New Orleanians or have a connection there, they are very protective over their history and the culture. And they don't want just anybody walking in and, and taking credit or, um, co-opting things to make it into, you know, commercializing it in a certain way. And so um, that that would speak to that experience. But I but I definitely think that that this is something we should we should think about pursuing just, you know, just as family searches going throughout Africa, documenting um, oral histories of people. There's a whole story here in the United States based off of Katrina and and family histories that were not yeah, we haven't even touched the surface on. So I just want, I just to, want to say thank you so much to Ms. Karen, Karen for joining us this evening and all, all of her fabulosity of uh, her background. So feel free to stay on with us. us. Um, Perhaps for Ryan, Ryan to brief on it, not a super long one. I had to ask Ryan a little bit. And I just want to say thank you to the chat room. Mammy mentioned that she needs to talk about her story. She was there and she watched it. It really relevant. And Katrina. And can I also say that the trauma associated also kills a lot of people afterwards. There was an aftermath of trauma in terms of the stress level that folks experienced. For in my family, a lot of folks died from that. They didn't die drowning in the house because they didn't get out, or they didn't die from exposure. They died from stress-related diseases as a result. I've literally, an entire section of my family was completely wiped out within 50, what, uh, 14 years of the storm. Like, everybody. And I'm from cancer, going into the house to clear the drywall out with the mold and all those other things. And I remember going to New Orleans once and reading the newspaper and looking through the Times picking you and it seemed like every single person in the obituary section died from cancer. Yes. And I and the only thing I have to relay it to is was it the stress and was it the was it all the stuff dealing with Katrina? You know, could we could we compare it to like Cancer Alley, you know? In the in the uh uh you know by like Whitney Plantation all that kind of stuff has anyone gone down there to study that? I'm not an epidemiologist, I, but I'm I'm not a public health person. But I honestly think that I don't know. I just think that that's something to consider. Nice. Um, yeah. All right. Well, um, let's go to Ask Mariah. We've got a short one for this evening. We also have a couple current events. All right, Ask Mariah is your favorite part of the show where you, the viewer, can submit your questions, queries, conundrums, and more to the panel. We weigh in live with research help specifically geared toward you. Panelists never see the queries beforehand, so you get a chance to see us work together live to help our Genia Buds get past their brick walls. Tonight's query is from Shannon Harris. Shannon Harris says, Michael Lewis Harris, this is her brick wall. He was a veteran from Louisiana and she's looking to trace her ancestors. What he or she knows, just a small entry from his death on a website, nothing more. And no DNA testing has been done. So how in the world do you find someone that you only have a death record for? We're looking for a Michael Lewis Harris. And... <laughs> What what can we find on Michael Lewis Harris if all we have is a small entry from his death on a website? What is the website? That's the first question I have. Is it the obituary? Is it the uh, obituary from the mortuary? Is it from the obituary from the newspaper? Is it a We Remember site? Is it what is it? Do we know? 
I mean, I would want to know the same thing. What, what, it, how does he know Michael Lewis Harris, who was a vet and on this death site is his Michael Lewis Harris? Mm -hmm. There, there right. has to be some identifying information on there and it shouldn't just say Louisiana. It should say where in Louisiana he's from to help him really zero in on that person. Uh, if it's a death certificate, then has he analyzed the death certificate? Who was the informant? Did they have the mother and the father's name on that death certificate? Did they have the cause of death? Did they have when he died? Uh, there's just so much information that he may want to gather just about this person's death to get more about this person's life. I agree. And, and yeah, how do you know that the Michael Lewis Harris is the right person? That's the first question. And if you know that they're a veteran, you can look uh, for uh, military service records in terms of depending on when, right, they lived and how old they were. If you're looking at somebody born in the 20s or so, you're looking at a World War II veteran, um, someone born 30s, 40s, maybe somebody that was in uh, Vietnam War. If they are mentioned as a vet in their obituary, nine times out of 10, they may be buried in a veteran cemetery. Um, you can look at the plot that the person is buried in to see if there's someone else that was also in that, also that same plot who was probably, you know, a family member. Um, the other thing is um, without more information and a location in Louisiana, saying just Louisiana, it's a little bit tough to try and find somebody that way. Um, if you don't have any other leads, if you have a potential birth date, if the person is born before 1940, you can try and track them down on a, the 1940 census, but that's not always foolproof because, you know, there were a million African-Americans left off that census. I always go back to that when people always say, well, I can't find the person in the census. I can't. My dad, my uncle, my aunt, my paternal grandparents, my entire great aunt's whole household, including six kids, were not on the 1940 census. <laughs> so, and these are immediate family members. So don't use that as a metric as, oh gosh, you know, I couldn't find them on 1940. So they just don't exist. No, my uncle's still alive. He's still breathing. He's going to be 80 this year. So, um, I would uh, I would uh, maybe Social Security Applications Index on Ancestry if you have a birth date um, to see if you can try and track down parents' names. I'd look 1940, but even that is kind of a crapshoot because it could be several people named Michael Harris with that birth date. How do you know you have the right one? Um, DNA testing. Um, what else do you guys think? You got to narrow this down more because it's not like you just said Marigueen mm -hmm. as the last name. <laughs> Right. And who and well, who are they to that person? Who who is this veteran to that person? Right. What's because the that would make some make some decisions too. You touched on everything about the military records, but is that person close enough of a kin to even access some of those? I'm wondering how is he kin to him. Well, so, didn't didn't answer me. I'm thinking it's a daddy. I'm just gonna put that oh, out there. Okay. Right. It's written like so, I'm looking for my daddy and he well, did right. and I don't know. So there well, I would is thought with DNA testing. <laughs> what you had said though. Yeah. We so argued about, about that person, at Maggie last year. <laughs> I think what this person found was probably a um social security death application, in which case, if the if my information is correct, this Michael Lewis Harris would have been black. He would have died in um Winfield. Wynn Parish, Louisiana. Which is North Louisiana. But he would have been right. And he would have been too young for them to list their parents on the social security death application okay. because he would have been born in 1956. However, there is a public obituary available for him that does list his parents and his grandparents and several relatives. I would look into this um, find a grave link for Michael Lewis Harris in the Winfield African American Cemetery, which is what its name is, and it has a full obituary link there detailing some of the other the other relatives, and then search for them in Winfield. Winfield is one of those places to also keep in mind they cross over the the um, Arkansas border often and go back and forth, so you can do some work around there too. Mm hmm. And remember, I always tell people uh, that. Uh, these parishes in the north are not the culture in the north is different than the culture in the south the ankle people and them heel and toe folks in louisiana is different than the calf folks 
Most of my folks are calf people. We're talking like the state of Louisiana is a boot and you're looking at the calf people. My, most of my folks are calf folks. I got some sprinklings in with the toe and the heel and the ankle people. Um, so th this different culture. It is. It's it is. I, yes, I, it I, is. Yes, I it call is. It, I call it South Arkansas or West Mississippi. Or East Texas. Or East Texas. <laughs> there you nah, go. East Texas I'm going to need the map of that. <laughs> East Texas is Louisiana. You got your Beaumonts and your Houstons and all them people. That's Louisiana. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, so here's the other thing, too, is this, this, um, it looks like Tom found the finder grave for a person named Michael Lewis Harris, um, who died in 1998 in Wynn Parish. He was only 42 years old. So, yeah, that would be, if this is the right person, this would be my question. Why did he die at 42? Right. Um, and then they've got all these people that are listening. And you know how good we are about the obituary. I'm actually working with a friend of mine on a program right now. Y'all know how we are about that paragraph at the end where you got to put the host after we'd have named everybody else and you got to put the host. <laughs> Why we need the host if we named everybody? Because <laughs> Danny only had two great grandkids and we had to let him know it was still living when he passed. The host, I think the host is like a weird flex. It's like an old folks flex in an in obituary. Like it really is because we already listed everybody out. And this obituary, if this is the right one, it lists, the person who put this in listed um, it was posted in the Alexandria Town Talk, right? So that means that 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 you, I would I would look at all of those. I mean, it literally is a paragraph of names. You need to find out where all of these people are. Look for the obituaries for some of the older people in the Alexandria Town Talk. In fact, that paper is on newspapers.com, and you may need the publisher extra for that one because I've used that for for people in my family. You've got several folks that went out to California um, who are on here. Um, folks in, in Winfield. And here's the other thing. If you know he's from Winfield, I might also say, take you behind there. And look at the courthouse. Yeah, go to the courthouse and see what's there. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but there's a there's a laundry list. You, I was like, seriously, it's like a 10-line paragraph of survivors include. And it just literally lists out everyone. Um, also, uh, go through that Winfield African American Cemetery. There's 61 graves there. See who else is buried there. And if they're mentioned in that obituary, because that obituary is 30 years old. So some of those folks that are within that paragraph have died at this point. That so that can is gone. Yeah, so so that can help you narrow down relationships because it mentions a son, four daughters, um, which it looks like Shannon is one of them. Hmm. Um, and they all seem to have different last names. It could be just because they are married. Um, mentions a mother and a stepfather, um, his father. Um, that lists where he's from, brothers. I would look at all of those people, search them out, treat them as, you know, run the genealogy on them um, and see, because because everyone that's there is not, they're not all still alive, not at this point. Any other suggestions that you all have before we move into current events? Okay. Ha, so someone says, uh, I Googled Merlene Triplett. That's one of the people mentioned mother living in Winfield, Louisiana. So yeah, I would say sometimes with this, it's just a Google, but I would do a, a newspapers.com search or genealogy bank um, and search out literally all those people who you're interested in um, and, and just see if you can find them. And, and get back to us and let you know, what you, let us know what you find. Cause you know, we're nosy like that. We get invested in people. <laughs> All right. Do you have a research brick wall? Would you like help from Black Progen scaling that wall? Submit your query today for our Ask Mariah segment. The link is in the description of each and every episode of Black Progen Live. Remember to be specific, tell us everything you've searched so we don't duplicate efforts if you get selected. And cross your fingers when you press submit, you just may get chosen for one of our upcoming episodes. Quickly, current events. This amazing story in BuzzFeed News was published on June 6th and it's called a brutal inheritance. 
His DNA solved a century old jailhouse rape. The victim was his grandmother. If you have not read this, who Lord, I think we all have a story like this in our families. No lie. As a black teenager in Compton in the 70s, Hiram Johnson began to wonder about his father's fine curly hair and the light brown skin that strangers sometimes thought he was white. Hiram knew only a few things about his father's childhood. Fred Johnson was raised in Jackson, Mississippi by his mother, Bernice. Fred said that Bernice was a, quote, beautiful black woman, but he never said a word about his father. All Hiram knew was that his grandfather was probably wasn't black. He often pestered his dad for more details. Do we have mixed heritage? Who was this man? What did your mom ever say about it? But Fred wouldn't budge. Over the next three decades, Hiram got married, had two daughters, and went into law enforcement, climbing the ranks of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. On a visit to Fred's house one day in 2008, Hiram asked the usual questions about their roots. This time, the 78-year-old finally opened up. Fred said his mother, Bernice, had been convicted of a killing, a neighbor, and served two years in the, inf in the infamous Mississippi State Penitentiary, better known as Parchment Farm. She gave birth to him shortly after her release, so his father could have been anyone another inmate, a guard, the warden, even the governor. Hiram was floored. That day, he launched what would turn into a decade-long hunt to identify his grandfather. After years of poring over state archives, court transcripts, and prison records, a genetic test last year finally gave him a definitive answer. Still shocked by the news that his grandmother had been in prison, Hiram started poking around online. He discovered the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, a century-old state agency whose mission is historic preservation, and sent in a formal request for records related to Bernice's time in prison. Soon, a thick stack of papers arrived in the mail. And this story is so good. Please check it out. True will post a link in the chat if you have not already read this. It was very, very good. Very good. Also, of course, we would be remiss if we did not honor Miss Leah tonight. Leah Chase, New Orleans matriarch of Creole cuisine, who fed civil rights leaders, musicians, and presidents in a career spanning seven decades, died on June 1st, surrounded by family. She was 96. Mrs. Chase, who put possessed a beatific smile and perpetually calm demeanor, presided over the kitchen at Dookie Chase's restaurant until well into her 10th decade, turning out specialties such as lima beans and shrimp over rice, shrimp club and cow, and fried chicken that was judged the best in the city in a poll by NOLA.com. Every Holy Thursday, hundreds showed up to enjoy gallons of her gumbo herbs, a dark, thick concoction that contains the last meat to be eaten before Good Friday. In, in May 2016, Mrs. Chase received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the James Beard Foundation, which sponsors the country's foremost food-related awards program for chefs and restauranteurs. Mrs. Chase fed most of the civil rights movement's leaders. In fact, you, you saw my cousin Jean a couple episodes ago before they left on their Freedom Ride, they ate where? Dookie Chase's restaurant. <laughs> um, she it mentions that uh, she served or uh, fed most of the civil rights movement leaders as well as African-American entertainers who couldn't eat in other New Orleans restaurants during the Jim Crow years. President George, H. George W. Bush ate there as did Senator uh, Barack Obama during the 2008 presidential campaign when Mrs. Chase stopped him from adding hot sauce to her gumbo. <laughs> I will also uh, remind folks that the character Tiana in um, A Princess and the Frog was based off of Miss Leah. So um, that's something to also think about as well. Ooh, and this one, Lord today, I love this update. They grew up hearing stories about their brilliant Harvard professor ancestor, the luminary who discovered the ice age and the movement of glaciers. For years, they ignored his other side, how he promoted racist, now debunked theory called polygenism to argue that African-American people were inferior to whites. Now amid a legal fight, Alex, I'm gonna pop you because you didn't mute yourself. Lord, you sound like you're eating chips. Um, <laughs> Now I'm in a legal fight with Harvard over a set of photographs of slaves that Agassiz commissioned, that's their ancestor, descendants of his are condemning his actions, apologizing for them and teaming up with descendants of Renty and Delia. If you recall, we talked about Renty and Delia in Harvard in a previous current event on Black Pro Gen Live. So now the descendants of the photographer who photographed them are coming together with the descendants of Renty and Delia. And they want Harvard to relinquish the photos 
to Tamara Lanier of Connecticut, a direct descendant of Renty, who sued Harvard in March, arguing the university profited off of images that belonged to her family. By stepping forward and owning my family connection to Louis Uggsies, I give voice to my belief that transforming out of the governing a lie of white supremacy is both possible and necessary, said Marion Shaw Moore, a third great granddaughter of Uggsies who resides in Minnesota. I want to be part of the healing of the wounds it has rendered. Wow. So we got to stay tuned for updates on this case because this is getting real juicy. All right. Have you checked out all the subjects we'll be covering during season five? Head to whoisnikasmith.com for a downloadable schedule so you don't forget your sexual reminders and you'll know what episodes are coming up. Don't forget to tune into the archive of the long running research of the National Archives and Beyond hosted by Black Pro Gen Life panelist Bernice Alexander Bennett. I believe she has a show this Thursday. I didn't get the information. What is it, Bernice? You want to come off mute and talk about it for a second? Yes, it's Black Home Status of the Great Plains. Mm, yes. Sounds interesting. Sounds interesting. Also, feel free to check out the archive of the African Roots podcast hosted by Black Progen Life panelist Angela Walton Raji. Visit AfricanRootsPodcast.com for more. And it's the place to learn, share, grow in African ancestor family history and genealogy. Watch out for our pre recorded show. It's not going to be live from the Midwestern African American Genealogy Institute 2019. The Teaching Institute. Now, if you want to catch us live and be in the chat in X Y X Y Z, you got to join us for this for this episode. That's going to be hilarious. Brothels, murderers, women of the night, thieves. Family history research can unearth truly colorful facts about our ancestors. In episode eighty nine, we'll cover how to gain more information on the infamous relatives and their interesting exploits. Join us on Tuesday, July thirtieth, at six p.m. Pacific, eight p.m. Central, nine p.m. Eastern for Dangerously Asians, Jailbird Relatives, and the Freaky Underside of Genealogy. I don't know if we should get dressed up for that one. Maybe we should all wear sunglasses or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, True, passing it over to you for you to shut us down for the evening. All righty, go ahead and pay the bills. <laughs> 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 Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We want to thank our guest, Miss Karen. Oh, you're always a delight when you're here. And I just hope you always keep coming back because <laughs> we need it and the viewers need it and they love it. Um, Bernice, we'll see you on Thursday. Thank you, Alex, for coming out. And we just enjoyed you all out there in the audience. So come on back to our next episode in July. I know it's going to be kind of spooky, <laughs> but we're going to have a good and a grand time. So we just want to thank you. Leave us a note on uh, Facebook or Twitter or leave us a comment in the section on the YouTube page. So we'll see you all then. Good night. <laughs> good night. <laughs> Black Pro Gen Live. Black Pro Gen Live. Black Pro Gen Live. Hello, everybody out there. Black Pro Gen Live. Black Pro Gen Live. The unapologetic Black and people of color viewpoint. It's a place where evidence tells the stories.